parallel stories in keeping with April's designation not as the cruelest month, but as the most lyrical, turns its gaze to poetry. And in particular to the work of LA-based award-winning poet Martha Ronk. This series often explores the connection between word and image, but today we add to it the idea of translation. Not just between one form and another, but between the very instrument of language itself, from image to word, photograph to poem, poem to painting, English to Italian. For this exploration, we are fortunate to bring together in discussion with Martha Ronk, the L.A. Louvre represented artist and her longtime friend and occasional collaborator, Tom Woodle, whose work is happily part of the museum's permanent collection. And acting as a kind of Virgilian guide through this exploration is UCSB professor of Italian and Renaissance studies, another friend of many years standing, John Snyder. Finally, and in fact, firstly, behind it all as matchmaker and muse, but seated in the audience, is Nevin Schreiner, writer, USC creative writing teacher and critic, who first suggested this intriguingly interwoven trio. So Nevin, I thank you wherever you are. Sorry. There you are. Thank you. Of Ronk's poetry, it has been said that she forges a language of attention that is vibrantly immediate. The same, too, could be said of Woodle's meditative and intricate studies, of which critic David Pagel wrote, he manages to make intense concentration look relaxed. Both describe a world dense in detail. Today, they provide us with an opportunity, rare in these fragmented times of short attention spans, to remind ourselves of the power inherent in the act of paying attention, and how somehow, in that moment, ordinary objects become charged presences. Please join me in welcoming Martha Ronk, Tom Woodle, and John Snyder. You want to say something? I, I, am I on? Yes, okay. <laughs> the mic is on. So I, I just wanted to, to say we will begin by hearing Martha uh, read selections from her book, Ocular Proof, her newest book. That, just came, when did it come out? In the fall. In the fall. So it's been out just a few months. Thank you. Um, I, I can't see you actually, so tell me if you can hear me. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I don't think that's it. I think it's on me somewhere. Um, and um, I think I just wanted to say a couple of things about um, the. I don't know, the kind of world that I came from in terms of writing ocular proof. There were a couple of things that I've always been interested in, and they formulated what um, I did in this book, or at least I was trying to do. Um, one of them is um, I've been interested for a number of years, and it mostly started because I was working on emblematic um, characters, particularly women, in Shakespeare's plays. That is, I was interested in moments in which the characters stopped dialogue and they were described visually um, in some way. And if anybody's interested, I could give you an example. But I worked for many years on this project and published essays and so forth. Um, and what I was looking at and what I actually joined with other faculty in a workshop to address is something called ekphrastic poetry. And many of you may know what that is, but it's really um, the way in which poets will address an art object in some way. Um, I suppose Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn is one of the most famous, but it's been done for many, many um, centuries, and it's something that has always interested me. And so ekphrasis is sort of behind all of this work because I looked at mostly black and white photographs from um, the 19th century, the early 20th century. Um, I love black and white. Um, color's okay, but I really like black and white <laughs> photographs. Um, and so those were the ones I took um, part in sort of thinking about a way of meditating on these poems 
um, and thinking about language that came out of that kind of med meditation. Um, and the other thing I would say that um, sort of stood behind this was, um, again, came out of my Shakespeare work, but it was um, work that, um, sort of critical work that dealt with the way in which the visual and the verbal were related to one another or weren't related to one another. And um, if you'll pardon my um, quoting here, there's an essay in the back of Ocular Proof that has to do with this. And I just want to read it to you so you know where I was standing when I was working on the book. Um, references to photographs become both proofs and failed proofs of what was there. Also, the juxtaposition of photographic images and poetic language itself enacts a kind of failure, since a writer can never bring an art object, a visual object, into language. And since the alternation of the visual and verbal seems to shatter each to acknowledge the failure of congruity, um, sort of questions, one questions the others. Um, I use references to photographs and poems as proofs and failed proofs of memory, history, documentation, especially memory. The image stands at an unstable crux, and the use of the photograph becomes a sign of the omitted or left out. And so this kind of attention that I was trying to pay to these photographs um, was something I realized that I couldn't succeed at but that I was hoping to sort of address what came out of um, those, um, those photographs. Um, okay, so let me start with the very beginning. There are three parts to the book, um, and the middle part is a different kind of uh, poem. So I'm just going to read from the first part and the last part. And the other thing I would say, um, about photographs, and it comes from a lot of reading that I did that I don't want to bore you with, but photographs have been, by many viewers, associated with um, dying, with disappearing, because you look at a photograph and you're looking at something that's over, that's past, um, and it's already gone in some ways, and so photographs have been associated with um, death in various ways. In many ways, this is a kind of elegy book. There are a number of elegies in it, um, and so forth. So, um, I'm just going to say some little piece of information. The first poem is called A Blurry Photograph. And I just want to say that the last section is a very quotidian one. Uh, the speaker's in the kitchen, putting away dishes. A blurry photograph. The tree azalea overwhelms evening with its scent, defining everything and the endless fields. Walking away suddenly, it slices off and is gone. The visible object blurs open in front of you. The outline of a branch folds back into itself, then clarifies just as you turn away, and the glass hardens into glass, as you go about taking care of things abstractedly, one thing shelved after another, as if they were already in the past, needing nothing from you until, smashing itself on the tile floor, the present cracks open the aftermath of itself. Ghosts. Um, <clears throat> the blur in the corner of the photograph, in the hills which fold over on themselves in infinite regress when witnesses are looking elsewhere. On the blue steps, the child made her way slowly and with specific intent. Karachesh photographed stairs extending past the small figure and out of sight. In ghost photos, the see-through specters stand behind the bereaved, 
They saw it, they believed, a beloved, a beloved walking in from the other world. In the hours spent on the blue stairs, pages came alive, and there was no time until interrupted. Baudelaire worried lest photographs impinge on the sphere of the intangible and imaginary. In the late 1850s, Gustave Le Bray pioneered a way of combining two negatives to create a print that showed a magical combination of sea or land and sky that had in fact never existed, hoping to evoke the visceral emotion of Wuthering Heights. And I love that quotation because it gives you a sense of the way in which these juxtapositions can, at least I hope they can, evoke a kind of mood um, that comes out of a fictive creation, which is what a poem always is. The picture plane. The actual world pushes a shrub of Ceanothus, stained its purple, up against the picture plane, a messy splay of branches, as though missing all the cues, it moved in close, breathing stale air. Some child has put sticky fingers in your hair, is sitting on the edge of your coat, is the child whose awkward stance is your own shoes, pointing pigeon-toed in a photo you remember the awkward itch of. Also called California lilac, the plant thrives on neglect, the imperfect conditions of hot wind sweeping across deserts in a movie of so much violence the children live on it, sensing a breakdown that's already occurred. Their games dwarfed by a range of San Gabriel mountains, almost indistinguishable and only seemingly benign. The, the photographer who um, mattered probably the most to me when I was writing this book, and in part because he had a show in Los Angeles, was Robert Adams, um, who takes incredible pictures of Los Angeles um, with um, scrub and desert and sort of awkward framing. Um, and I just love them. So. This is called No Sky. For those of you who've been in Los Angeles, you know that kind of white missing area that we call the sky. <laughs> um, no sky after Robert Adams' California views. No sky, a gray backdrop nearly, and below the scraggle of dusty fronds, the scrub oak and scrub jay, whose abrasive noises sharpen in response. Shadows proliferate in deep furrows, no sky above, merely a scrim registering conical thrusts, a heightened flurry and outlines of branches, the dead ones slowly petering out. Magnificent ruin, the cut through the field, blasted chaparral. As I understand my job, this is Robert Adams, it is, while suggesting order, to make things appear as much as possible to be the way they are in normal vision. An unvoiced series of sentences without articulation, with gray shapes, formulating a syntax, loosening and then tightening from edge to edge. The frame sets a border, down from which a thin straggle hangs at random like purposeful intrusion and so unlike. And the interstate, interstate in the title, missing from the photograph itself, merely a dry riverbed, the density of shadows, trapped in the confusion of bush and bush-like tree. Except from higher up than the rest, its thin trunk arched against no sky, colorless, less often remarked upon, appositely emotionless these days, a relic, 
like the fan palm living at the edges of water. The photographic object. Um, this is very much about um, the crossover between um, the speaker and the photograph. Um, and it comes from work I was doing before I started these poems. I wrote a book prior to this, just prior to this, called Transfer of Qualities, which is a photo, which is a quotation from Henry James, in which um, the viewer is looking so intently at the object that there's a kind of crossover of qualities. Um, and for those of you who've read Henry James, you might think about the Golden Bowl or, um, you know, many of his various objects that seem to have a life that refers to the characters themselves. The photographic object. It's too close or too far away to be seen at the fogged horizon. My balance is off, clearing away the brush at the side of the photograph, tying up bundles to be carried away and pruning what's left. What, for God's sake, is that roundish bit on top of a shrub over there, branches any good wind might break, asymmetry in disheveled light. It's either dense shadow or a tree, either downhill or a camera tilt, ironic or a story hidden in what's seen. What was I seeing in the dusty leaves and skin and endless hours? Even afterwards, calm, astringent, and still black and white. That kind of wonderful bafflement at looking at something so hard you're not actually sure what it is that you've seen. Um, the great French photographer Brassai took beautiful pictures at night, um, as did Robert Adams, um, and this is called Brassai's night photographs, and they were of Paris. Photographing Paris at night, Brassai wanted to be raised to the level of object. The world is richer than I. The walls, speaking to him in graffiti, chipped from a childish drawing of interlocking hearts, only seemingly symbolic, only seeming impossible. On such days, reification attracts as the whole city spreads out before you. Metempsychosis, not from flesh to flesh, but from where he stood, his large camera before him into bridges across the Seine. Um, and here's a couple of other Robert Adams poems. Um, I hope some of you know his work. If you don't, um, and you live in this part of the world, which you clearly do, um, I recommend them. <laughs> of somewhere out west. The photograph drags on in its washed out way of the skies missing behind the usual white of western light. Tire marks whiten the dirt, disappear in the puddle left from last night's rain. The white isn't white, the black isn't black, but incremental shades of gray, more of them than seems possible. Some verticals called trees are on a small rise in the distance. It's not a wasteland by either metaphor or fact. Ideals haven't settled in, nor a crescent moon, nor a gibbous. But off frame, a lament seems about to begin to hold off as the ordinariness of human effort claims its own tire marks laid down by the ab absent truck hauling stuff and were drawn in as witnesses to the material facts of having been there, the insistent weight of being. Um, and this one is an, an elegy, and I mentioned before that there are a number of them uh, in, this, in this collection. Elegy, and a photograph by Robert Adams. Headlights light up a weed 
than a cone of blossoms lifting off into shadows driven by the demarcation of time. And they stay with us as we go forward in undifferentiated dark. They fade out slowly, those conical bright shapes out from the field and across our dashboard. He had walked into, fallen into the truck crossing the road. Later, he had fallen into the water near the pier. Earlier, he had decided, or he hadn't decided, or it had shaped itself around him. It's hard to see sunflowers in the dark, but the dark center, surrounded by many gray petals, is immediately clear despite shadows, despite tricks, play on the eye. It seems more than obvious that nothing particular is about to happen. When the painters paint the white line down the middle of the road, do they see how it shines in the near dark, nearly upon us? Um, in the 19th century, there was a vogue for um, giving some solace purportedly to those who had lost a loved one. Um, and there were several uh, charlatans who figured out how to make these kind of ghostly spec, you know, spec, spectral photographs of the ghosts of the one you had just lost standing behind you. Um, and there was a man named Munger who was especially famous for these kinds of photographs. So, this one is a, is a poem about that effect um, called Ghosts. Of course, they aren't around anymore. They never were in that way, nor at the time. And it's hard to grasp how ghostly it is behind the printed record. And whether new forms of being are generated is a question arising in consequence. Proliferation giving even less ground to stand on and suggesting a, an obsession with whoever looks out, not in, on the world, slowly lifting its waters around and unable to maintain its shape. No one was close to dying in that photograph. All the lights were on. In the glow of the evening, and only distance prevented knowing down to the patterns on the wall and the rummaging around. In the sky, all the stars that aren't there are almost visible to children waiting around, excited to a pitch when one goes suddenly out. And um, I think I'm going to skip to the last section and read you a couple of other more specific um, poems. Um, this one, um, the, set, the third section is really grows out of these black and white photographs and um, it focuses on shadows, because obviously in black and white photographs you're very aware of shadows. And since we live, I live in Los Angeles, where the sun is that enormously bright, unyielding kind of sun, um, you always see the shadows of um, various kinds of trees and um, eucalyptus and so on, um, looking down at the cement on the sidewalk. Only a weed, and of the reedy sort, out of the sidewalks, unnoticed, unremarkable but for its shadow cast on the concrete. A thinner than paper-thin puppet caught in a glance, still and only slightly blurred by air. The beauty of something cast out of mere light and shade, imprinted and unpeeled by finger and thumb, yet animated by the stirring of air like strings pulling on the leaves, a scribble across what is now a moment extended, without purpose or connection, the what for? And um, I think I have a word. Philadelphia, PA, 1967. Lee Friedlander. 
So Lee Friedlander was very famous for um, taking photographs which um, also exhibited his shadow, so you could see the photographer um, in the photograph. All giant elbows forcing his way into his own photo. His shadow overtakes the doorway. The camera outline lost just above the doorknob against which the chair is shoved. A torso looming in a shrinking room, the exact shadow of the inexact, shapeless, insistent, a barrier to anyone's coming in or out, yet walking seamlessly through the closed door in a well-worn disguise as one's self. Here again, on again, winged elbows of refusal against solidity. A game repeated over and over, testing the tactful world, a tentative and harder push, as if film could capture that final fade into a blank wall. He himself refused any information but the date of when it was made. And I'm going to close with a um, poem that I hadn't mentioned to anybody, but it's the last poem in the section. Um, it's actually not the very last, it's the second to the last. And um, it's about disappearance. One's own, of course, bearing advance witness to the missing. An image in a photo, typing as I am, watching oneself as what is not. Warrior of the future, in which I am not. Baudelaire in Paris Spring, Spring, 1 a.m., released from the tyranny of the human face, bathed in shadows, able to produce a few lines. Two days ago, the death of a man I married at 22, an infinite series of adjectives, a remembrance wearing a suit, a wallet, a pile of contact sheets is not. Each as good as any other, missing the point, missing the facts of the case. Bart says, unlike photos, writing has no evidential force, lacking its photographic celluloid shape. Light spilling across the wall flooded his basement. Across the wall, across from fingers I no longer recognize, typing a time when I was the age I was. Light comes in shutters, lifelike. Later on, we say, and mean it, always on the brink of oneself. Thank you very much. Martha, um, I was hoping we could have a few minutes of conversation about what you've just read to us, um, and we have a lengthy program, of course, but we want to want to begin by by talking to you a bit. So, I was wondering if you could just tell us how it was that you came to be the writer. Um, how did you arrive at this odd uh, thing? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I wrote poems as a child. I remember winning a prize um, for a Halloween poem. You know, as children in school, you have to say, write a Halloween poem and write a winter poem and all those things, so I did that. And then when I got to college, I majored in English and I wrote poems. Um, but I was very focused on academics, so um, I sort of did some in my spare time, but not much. And then I went to graduate school, and then um, I got a job. And then my then husband um, and I moved to Los Angeles. And it was enormously dislocating for me. Um, first of all, my husband was a photographer. So we had spent a lot of time thinking about photographs. And I got a camera, and we had a dark room in the bathroom. And um, I took some courses. and. Um, Anyway, that's how that sort of came about, but I think it was really the 
enormous sense of dislocation that made me want to write because we have moved from the East Coast. Um, I've never seen a desert. I've never seen really a whole lot of cactus. Um, I was pregnant. I didn't have a job for the first time in my life. And I, um, I don't know, I took a class at CalArts um, from a man named Clayton Eshelman um, on writing and um, mostly on Duncan, on Robert Duncan. And um, I just, that sort of started it. And then I took a couple of classes um, at Bennington College in the summer. Um, and that sort of, um, that's, how I got, that's how I got started writing. And I've been very lucky because um, I, it's, I got published. And so, you know, it just um, was pretty amazing. And I've now got about 11 books and a collection of short stories. And um, I'm working on another one at the moment. And um, I don't know what I would do without it, sort of. That's, Came to. Um, perhaps you'd be willing to talk to us a little bit then. You were a photographer. For a very short period of time. I mean, it really was the first few years I lived in LA. And then um, I um, got a job. <laughs> then I wanted to get tenure so that I could support my child. And so, because um, my husband had gone back to the East Coast. and. So um, I didn't have so much time to do it, but then I started, so I was published, for a number of years I was doing academic work and writing at the same time, um, and um, you know, going to conferences and so forth. So. so the decision to write about photography, was that motivated by your personal story, or is, was so. there some other interest involved as well in the choice of um, I think it was both the, um, you know, sort of my biography, and then I think part of it was the um, the way in which photographs are both a kind of document. That is, many people look at them as documents, and also um, not documents. That is, constructed, made, um, made by the eye of the photographer, framed in certain ways, um, and it was that quality about them that interested me quite a bit. So are you saying that the, it was the paradoxical nature of photography yeah. that was what yeah. drew you to it? But so it's, it's not that I haven't, I've written also about paintings and so on, and I also think that there was a way in which, um, I had written ephrastic poems before. I wrote a series for my parents when they died um, using Dutch still life paintings, that sort of moment I then I wrote a series for um, a man who had committed suicide, whom I loved, and I used, um, he had been to China, and so I had used um, Chinese paintings and school paintings because I was team teaching with a colleague who was a Chinese painting expert, and so, that, so these are happenstances, I think. But it seems that you're attracted to the theme of absence that haunts photography. Is that, yes. is that a fair? That's very fair. <laughs> um, exact, actually. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> well, then let's talk for a couple of minutes, if we can, um, because we're, we're here at the intersection of poetry and the visual arts, because we have Tom Pulse with us as well. Um, but could we talk a little bit about your interest then in photography as exploring this relationship that you raise repeatedly in, in the book, you talk about elegy, um, as a relationship between seeing and memory, as it were, because it seems to me that that is at the heart of what you're looking at in this book. Um, and of course, I mean, it seems to me that all seeing is a kind of well, it's both remembering and at the same time it's necessarily a forgetting, right? Because if you actually could remember everything that was in your visual field at this instant, you would be unable to see anything at all. So you, you have to forget in order to see, right? Well, I'm sure Tom has something to say about that, but maybe you have something to say right now about that. Um, 
<laughs> no, we'll go on with this. I'm just just to explore the paradoxical nature of what well, you're talking I think, about. Um, Seeing as a kind of forgetting. Yes, I think that's right. And I think that partly um, in looking at a photograph, um, I have um, tried to do that with a lot of concentration and um, a, a kind of um, move into another state where you are not paying attention to other parts mm -hmm. of the world and to what you're seeing in your boring study, whatever it happens to be, but really just focusing on the photograph as hard as you can and seeing what it generates. Um, one of the uh, critics that I read uses the word um, looking at things hard in order to go on an adventure. And I thought that was interesting as a way in which it takes you into memories, into other people's work, into um, other photographs or other images that you've seen, into um, associations. And then, for me anyway, I usually have a draft that comes out of that. And then what I try to, and I spend a lot of time doing revisions that attempt to um, get rid of some of the things that seem very extraneous and um, make it into something. Um, and um, yeah, I guess um, you know, part of what I was trying to say about this visual and verbal thing is that in that kind of confusion or paradox or whatever goes on in that moment, I think of it as being similar um, to something that um, Keats called negative capability. That is a way in which you're putting yourself in a paradox or in mystery or in um, bafflements of some sort. And um, yeah. um, well, so you talk about the visual and the verbal, and you've just spoken about looking, but of course, poetry is a kind of writing. So writing isn't exactly looking, is it? So you're translating looking or the visual frame into words. And so therefore, if it's a photograph that you're looking at and writing about, if a photograph is a representation, then you're essentially trying to represent a representation in language, essentially. Is that, would you say yes, that's fair? It's a it's I kind of translation. It can't work. I don't think work. it can work. Okay. Because I notice you're very careful not to actually describe the photographs that you're looking at. Um, do you want to talk about that for a minute? I mean, there's a lot yeah, of Yeah, because I think um, you can't actually ever describe what you're looking at, um, that there's always um, something that's left out or something that isn't attended to. Um, and so I think it's, um, maybe this is wrong, but I think it's similar to a kind of expanded metaphor where you were thinking this is in some ways related to um, an approximation of uh, this other. So it's in that way you're doing it. A translation, and I'm not a linguistic translator. That is, I don't do what you do, um, so I don't know exactly what that is like. But it's an approximation in some way in which you're trying to get at some some representation, but it's never going to be that thing. You're not going to get all the way to the original no. anyway. So essentially, what you're saying is what you do is a kind of translation of a translation. Because the, the photograph is translating light, as it were, onto cellular or on a film or digital now, whatever, yeah. and then you're translating that again. Yes. So and do you feel that that's and you feel that's a process of loss that you're moving further and further away from whatever was there. I think it's process. loss, and I also think you're in the process of making something. That is, you're making something that um, attempts a kind of other thing. Um, the word that Tom and I keep using is fictive, then you're know, making something else. Um, so it isn't meant to be just um, as close a description as you can get. It's really trying to 
take all of these elements and fuse them in some way that creates a kind of energy or that creates another kind of way of thinking. I always think that poetry is a kind of thinking. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who want to separate um, analysis or thinking from poetry. And I don't, I think it's just another kind of thinking um, that you're doing. I wonder if you could talk to us, Ernie, because you, a couple of times you stopped in the poems you read and you read as a citation yes. uh, from another person who you, that you'd inserted into your poem. So it's a kind of, uh, almost a kind of collage-like practice. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Yes, part of that, I think part of that is the... And those um, are prose fragments yeah, inserted in your yeah. poetry. So I think part of that is the, um, the sense of um, making a collage that, um, where the two things speak to one another but aren't exactly identical. Um, I left a bunch of them out, but um, it, I, you know, there's a way in which it's another addition to thinking um, about what it is I'm looking at or what I'm experiencing in some way. So I think what's important for me is that sense of um, trying to bring things together that create something different. And it can be, and of, of course I was reading a lot of commentary on photographs. So they um, influenced ways I thought and, um, and they were documents. The way in which people think about photographs as documents, it was sort of my homage to that sense of documentation. Um, you, you speak a lot in the book about shadows. Shadows seem to be very important to the book. Because the, the last section, which you didn't read much of, uh, has a poem called Shadows that I think is the final poem. Right. It's a long poem. It's the only long poem. The one at the end, yeah. Exactly. Um, and I suppose you could look at a shadow as a kind of writing, light writing, if you will, or you could look at it as a kind of absence um, of something that's not there. Um, what is it about shadows for you? Um, I mean, I think right away about John Cassavetes great film, Shadows. I don't know if anybody, anybody ever seen John Cassavetes' film? A few people, what an amazing. Oh, you got to see it. It's his first film okay. uh, about New York City in the late 50s and the race relations in the United States. It's very amazing stuff. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I think about um, two things, I guess. One of them is that um, Fox Talbot, who was one of the first uh, photographers, talked about photography as light writing. Um, and so I was... I didn't make that up. I didn't make it up myself. Either. No. Anyway, um, and I think it had to do with um, the sense of fadingness which runs through this book, you know, the way in which um, one becomes a shadow of oneself or these ghost photographs that were made. Um, and also I think part of it is um, circumstantial. I live in a place with a lot of shadows. They just are everywhere in LA. I, I was sitting with my grandchild yesterday, and we were using chalk on cement. And there was this beautiful image of um, a tree um, on, the, on the ground. And the two of us were tracing you know, images of it. And uh, sh shadows, I remember when I first moved to LA, one of the things that I, I think it was the Nestle building. It was a huge cement building. And every time I drove by it, there were these gorgeous shadows on it. And I think that just is part of place. You know, I think you can see that my interest is in place partly because of the photographer who had the most influence on me, which is somebody who took pictures of Los Angeles, which I've always found a very complicated, difficult uh, city. Um, it's just baffling in some ways to me. Um, <laughs> You've lived there a long time. I've lived there all my life, practically, I know. <laughs> well, let me ask you one last question uh, okay. before we have a look at some uh, images. Um, and, I mean, reading your, your book, I thought also about uh, W.G. Sebald, who you Absolutely. don't mention, but 
I don't think you mentioned in the back, yeah, but yeah. She, uh, you do. Mention you do mention in the back. So I do. I do oh, but I look at some numbers. You know, I um, I wrote a book um, called Vertigo, which uh, was based on reading Sebald, and um, I was incredibly influenced by the way in which he used prose and photographs and memory. I mean, he was after an attempt to get at memories, but every time he followed out a line of thinking, um, the memories were fake. Uh, not all of them, but many of them were um, made up in some way. And in many ways, the photographs sometimes applied to the prose he was writing and sometimes didn't seem to, or at least I couldn't figure out how they did. Um, and I adore Sable. So I think, do I. Huh? So do I. I, could not. <laughs> I think the loss of him was one of the great losses um, because he didn't live long enough. He was in a car. 57. His daughter was driving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I make it a point to reread Austerlitz once a year because it's just one of the most fabulous books. I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't agree with you more. I mean, I think Austerlitz is one of the greatest novels to be written in, in the English language or yeah. translated from German in the last 30 or 40 years. It's absolutely astonishing. Yeah. So, in that book, what I tried to do, yeah, he wrote these very long, convoluted sentences with, you know. Uh, Parentheses that went on and on and on. Right. So it's I found it. Right. <laughs> right. It just seems, at the, at, on the one hand, he seems so cold and analytical, and yet the book is utterly heartbreaking. It tears your heart out. You know? All of them. Yeah. Without the slightest yeah. emphatic. Nothing. Sure it's just done right. so subtly. Yeah. Anyways, if you haven't, these there are four novels by Say Vault, and they're all great, but Austerlitz is, I think, his masterpiece. Great. Absolutely. And he, he works, and sometimes you see him in his photographs, you see his reflection in the store window while he's taking a photo or something, or shadow, just yeah. like Friedlander yeah. uh, used to use. Well, I did, so I wanted to write a book in, in sort of thanks to him in some way, so I wrote a long line of poems <laughs> because, you know, because he had done that. So. Well, so I, I think my last question for you, and then we'll, we'll turn to Tom for a bit and give you a rest, um, has to do with whether you think you're, you're using verse, because at the middle section that you skipped is, in, is prose poetry, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, I and, think so too. And you mentioned Baudelaire uh, a couple of times in the book, Baudelaire wrote the the little poems and prose, the, the, the sort of first great prose poem collection in uh, Western literature. Um, but I wonder whether you think that this is an attempt that you move towards prose because you want to narrate, or are you still obsessed with description, the way you see photography as having this necessarily descriptive function. You talked about ekphrasis, which is the this uh, art of description, if you will, coming from antiquity to us today. Um, because your images are never totalizing. You're never trying to give us the photograph that you're looking at. But you're trying to perhaps tell us a story that has to do with someone viewing the image at the same time uh, as we are getting a glimpse of the fragments of it through the through the text that you write. Um, how do you see that relationship between poetry as storytelling and poetry as a process of description? Um, I'm not sure no, I can answer that question. so well, but I yeah. think um, the middle section is about other kinds of ways in which we get information visually. Uh, there's a lot about film and um, so, on. so I think it was just another more prosaic, you know, prosaic um, ordinary sense of, of how we get information. Um, and it, I wanted it to be different, um, partly for contrast, I and mean, partly to have different sections of the book. Um, but you're asking me something else. Right? No, no, no. I, th I, no. I think I was, what I was trying to get at was that I think your book, would be, it's, because it's very controlled, the way that you write your your verse, your poems. I mean, they're very, 
out of the words are very carefully selected as punctuation. Everything is very controlled, but you're telling us a story about the vertigo that is generated through a photograph. Uh, the experience of vertigo, let's put it that way, that you feel. And you have a wonderful citation from John Milton, a very unfashionable poet now. Um, I know the English department at UCSB has stopped uh, requiring the students to read him, but it's so too bad. Um, who shall tempt with wandering feet the dark, unbottomed, infinite abyss, and through the palpable obscure find out his uncouth way? <laughs> Love that. <laughs> I was like, struck by lightning when I saw that. Uh, it's just marvelous. That He's talking to all the students who are going to have to discover it on their own because they're not going to get the education. Stepping over the edge and falling into this. It's so wonderful. I wrote my dissertation on the Paradise Lost. <laughs> so is that what photography performs for us? And are you trying to replicate that in some way? I hope so. Well, we'll carry on. But we want to turn to Tom for a bit now. So, um, do you want us to look at, at the images, or do you want to start by talking a little bit, Tom, about how you came to be a painter and came to these images? Well, okay. Um, in ten more through less. <laughs> I I knew as a child already that I was an artist and. and most people who are artists always say that, I think. I've, I've heard a lot of artists speak about their work, and inevitably, although some do come to it late in life, uh, um, so by the time I was 10, I already knew that I was going to be doing it. But I've had to paint a lot of really uh, embarrassing, <laughs> Uh, problematic work for many years until I finally got to do what I'm doing now. And I've only selected a few slides of recent work that has developed in the last 10 years. So um, I'm sure you can speak to this as well, that um, it's one thing for someone to say that they know that they're an artist. Um, it's another thing for that identity to become formed so that it's complete and it's an individual statement. It takes a, some artists are lucky they happen on that very early on. I think, I think uh, you see that, you know, um, someone like Picasso, for instance, or Velasquez, they were able to know who they were very, very, very early on. And then there have been other artists who, for whom it took a very, very long time to find out what they ought to really say. And that is a, you know, just currently there's a show in San Francisco I saw last week and pairing Demon Corn and Matisse. And it's almost, uh, you know, exhausting and heartbreaking watching Demon Corn working really, really hard, but fumbling, 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 fumbling around for, the, for year after year till he can finally understand what he's supposed to be doing. And I, I could relate to, to that. Uh, all along, you are developing insight, uh, and you know, from moment to moment you feel, well, I've really done something, I've accomplished something. Then, of course, retrospectively, you realize that the, you know, what you have done is just slogging in, in the mud. Uh, and then there comes a moment where, luckily, you really understand, and there was a time, there's a, a painting that I did 
over 20 years ago that spoke to this, and the title of it was Desperate Mirror. It, I, I, it was the only way that I could express the desperation I was feeling on realizing that I was just continually, even though I had technical proficiency and you know some intellectual uh, sort of legitimate underpinnings to the work, there, I knew I was desperate because I was just appropriating uh, modalities and even images that had been invented and you know manifested by others, and uh, it's uh, it's impossible not to for the longest time unless you're somebody who's really really smart and very good at what they do. And I'm you know not that way, so it took me a longer time to arrive at what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm by no means suggesting that this is some something worthy of consideration, but that's sort of it. And the turning point for me was this. Uh, there was a person uh, who was part of the art world um, uh, many years ago in LA. His name was Ed Works, and some of you may know of him or may have known him. Uh, he he eventually became a therapist, and most of his clients were artists. I, he was never my therapist, but he liked artists, and we're, I'm not going to detail that relationship, but suffice it to say, um, we both had an interest in, in, in Buddhism. And one day I was visiting him. This was many, many, many years ago like over 30, nearly 40 years ago. He lived in Pasadena, and we used to get together, have lunch, chat. And uh, as I was leaving one day, he handed me a book. And he said, are you familiar with this? And I said, no. And the book is the Avatamsaka Sutra, which at that time had only been partially translated by Thomas Cleary, Cleary only about half of it. And I said, I didn't know anything about this book, but thank you, you know, uh, for lending it to me. Turns out, you know, he gave it to me. Um, and actually, it wasn't until after Ed passed away that I actually started reading this book. And it was one of those moments that we have all had from time to time, luckily. The, the, the first word, the second word, the third word, the first sentence, that was it. I just knew I had discovered the thing I'd been looking for all along. Not only was this a fundamental text for me regarding my practice meditation, but I, I realized this was it. This, my imagination was just set on fire from the very first sentence of this book, and in its entirety, the Avatamsaka Sutra, is, the translation is over a thousand pages. Dale knows it well. Uh, and I've had an opportunity to read it. I'm on my third reading of it now. Um, and so it's a fundamental text for me. Uh, and so, you know, there's this re reciprocity. We know how important literature, prior to this, you know, there was a time when Borges was very important. There was a time when uh, Beckett was very important, and my work, you know, you can track my work, you can see by the authors that I've been reading at the time. So for the last 10 years, though, even though I do read other books, this is my, the primary, you know, focus of attention for me, so. I would say, though, that many people found his work not at all problematic uh, earlier on, and um, there were Lots of people in the art world who also would agree with me. 
tongue, no matter what he just said. <laughs> so that brings us to an interesting point of divergence between the two of you and something maybe we can have a conversation about. So um, Martha's been writing about photography, and so those are instants that are captured technologically and also artistically, obviously. Um, uh, Tom, I, as I understand it, sometimes you're spending now up to four years on a single, on the surface of a single painting. Sometimes well, that's working. a little exaggerated. A little but, exaggerated, but not too but, exaggerated. You know, I, I'm currently working on something that has been going on for over a year, okay. and it's still not even close to being fully formulated. Like and you're long using. Complete. A jeweler's loop to work on surfaces and, and uh, very small brushes. Yes. So I don't know if the pictures will do any. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, I have to say this. While Just Ma while when I read Martha's book and I've been you know rereading it this week as well, uh, it it seems to me that a more appropriate pairing would have been an artist like Agnes Martin for <laughs> for what you're doing. My work looks vulgar by comparison to what, what Martha is doing textually here. Uh, I think what we have in common, though, is rigor. The, you had mentioned before, you know, the not only the contemplative element, but a very keen attention to detail, not uh, and that is one of the challenges, and it's a tightrope that one walks. Certainly, I don't know about you, but for myself, um, detail in an artwork um, can, you know, the tightrope an artist walks is who is who is obligated to detail um, is. You, one is courting disaster continually because the detail can so easily be um, gratuitous. And then there's just a lot of finicky stuff to look at um, and it, it just becomes a burden to the viewer rather than every detail um, uh, contributing to content and insight. So I have to tell you that is my personal challenge. Uh, a lot of that detail is impossible to see in this work and lamentably, and you know, I really dislike this. I dislike when artists of any sort get up and apologize and, and lament because it's rather it's distasteful. Uh, I know, so I apologize <laughs> But you know the irony is that you can truly the only way one can appreciate the artwork itself is at, at its proper scale. And <laughs> when it is, it's not intended to be viewed That's in right. a monumental scale when it's projected. And that, that's just because, something I'm going to have to live Because they're more like 25 inches? Well, some of them are even smaller. But okay. yeah, they can be larger. Some of them, yeah. the largest piece is, you know, about four by five okay, feet well, here. So that's a, that's a larger large scale. Piece. And that's happened, you know, recently. But just one last thing about the detail is this. The content of the sutra is essentially the enlightenment experience of the Buddha. And of course this, you know, this is, <laughs> it's an impossibility to do, uh, but that is that is what this text is. The opening lines are telling you that you are at the enlightenment site and therefore as you continue in the sutra uh, and the conclusion I've come to, I've discussed this with Dale also and the more I read it the more it seems obvious to me. This book, this text, because it's not a book, it's a redacted 
text has had many generations of, you know, product. Um, it's basically a literary mandala. And a mandala is basically a map of the universe, of everything inside it. And uh, it has entrances and exits and, you know, everything reflects uh, upon itself continually. It's a kaleidoscopic kind of uh, image. And I'm convinced that this book, even, even though I've no, I have no authority in saying this because I'm not a scholar of Buddhist texts, I'm not a literary scholar of any sort, but from what I know about mandalas, from the study I've made, from the visual uh, familiarity I have with these images, when I read this text, and the more I read it, the more obvious it becomes to me that that's what's going on here. Well, and, sorry. oh, yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> Let me just finish this. Please do. The, the one thing that fascinated me right away, and that I realized was going to be this challenge that I was enthusiastic about taking on, especially when it came to details that we're talking about, is the text is truly fascinating in that it, it's trying to, not only, and it successfully does communicate the infinite propagating pluralities that make up everything that you can see and all the invisible stuff that makes up the stuff that you see, the invisible stuff that you can't see that makes everything that you see. And it's, you know, the, the term that I've so got to use is, you know, <laughs> propagating pluralities. And so my intent is not necessarily to illustrate the text, because I'm not fond of that kind of, you know, that's not my mission as an artist. I don't see myself as an illustrator. But I want to be able to visually communicate the intensity of the, this, you know, mega plurality of stuff that is beyond comprehension. And that is what excites me visually. The other thing that I'd like to think I'm doing, although who knows whether this is true or not, but this is a moment where you, you, you're publicly listening to an artist perhaps making a complete fool of themselves. <laughs> because uh, one of the things that we spoke, you and I have spoken about are conventions that are inescapable, both in literature and in art. There are basic structures without which you can do nothing. Well, in the world of Buddhist art, there's some very specific conventions. And I'm not saying this arrogantly now. I I, I truly am doing my best not to be arrogant about this, but I feel all the conventions that are, have been employed up until now to represent Buddhist art are exhausted at this point. They are exhausted like images and conventions were exhausted at the beginning of the 20th century when whole new conventions needed to be invented in order to say the things that needed to be said. And I would like to think, and I know this will be thoroughly misunderstood by a lot of people and vehemently argued against, that, and that uh, I'm even doing something sacrilegious perhaps, by refreshing these conventions that have been in place for the longest time and being able to articulate something about Buddhism the way I understand it today, which is very different than people understood it long ago when they originated some of these images. So, well, uh, thank you for that. I, I just wanted to jump in quickly and before we look at your images and just say, I mean, I thought this was a lovely pairing of the two of you. You know, going back to the Renaissance, 
there was always a rivalry between poetry and painting. Those were considered the two arts that struggled for supremacy but one with the other. There was also a rivalry between the drawers and the painters. Well, absolutely. <laughs> but painting was considered because it had color. It's a word. Yes. I mean, it was it was considered sort of the supreme uh, art by the by the mid 16th century, yeah. and so there was this. And of course, the poets wanted to assert their age-old title of being the supreme artist. So it's fun having the two of you sitting next to each other <laughs> and, um, and, and, and trying to uh, uh, talk together about your art. I did want to say, Tom, something that struck me in looking at your work, because I, I do understand what you're saying about trying to renew art, but at the same time, um, you're drawing on the flower symbolism that's really very deeply embedded in Buddhist art, unless I'm totally wrong about it. I've only traveled no, in those parts of the world. Correct. I haven't studied it. Correct. Yeah. I'd like to think that the way I'm presenting the image, though, is refreshing it, bringing something, allowing it to address some of these complexities that have been relegated to being diagrammatic in the past. I am, you know, my entire heritage is figuration, right? And so I, I am, I love figuration, I'm interested in it, I, I worked very hard for many years to develop my technique, only later to find out that, you know, you know Okay, now, now what the hell do you do with it? Now try to say something. And my intention now is to see if I, what I can do regarding this, these graphic devices that have been employed to uh, reduce images into symbols that could almost be word read by like words rather than kind of the notation. image being alive itself the way you would see a Rembrandt portrait of a person be alive. How about we show okay. the public a little bit? Right. So let's give it a let's try. Do that. And you can. So I've only selected about four or five of recent images and frankly I don't remember some of the the titles, uh, the, all the titles, it doesn't matter whether I remember them or not, I can tell you that the titles are all taken from sentences out of the Thomas Clearly translation of the Sutra. So when I'm reading, I've got my sketchbook right there, and I make notes, and when a certain set of words, a, a phrase, um, you know, signals itself as being somewhat somehow memorable, I write it down and then but, you know, I just have lists of these and I just I look at the work when I'm finished with it and then I I select what I think will be an appropriate uh, phrase to go with it. But it doesn't really matter because that is a random selection. I'm not I haven't set out to illustrate that particular piece of text. Okay? So this is a fairly recent piece and this is one of, this is something new that I've been doing uh, and it happened simply because of another mistake I made. In any case, the, this piece is only about this big, so you have to imagine it. And it's clearly dimensional, right? You, uh, if you, if this is not uh, this is not a Trump Loy image. Uh, the, 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 these images are painted. Uh, there's some photography that uh, is used, like those roses, and then the leaves, the maple leaves, are all um, uh, painted and cut out and, and placed on here. Uh, and the gridding has been part of the my imagery for a long time. And, this gridding, you know, uh, recently there was a show at the Getty Museum you might have seen about um, alchemy, right? This how artists 
have tried to represent the unseen stuff that makes the visible world. Um, they, you can see that from the earliest times, um, you know, there's even whole texts that you can consult that are called sacred geometry, sacred math. So I'm, I'm not doing anything new here when I'm employing these grid, grids. I'm just trying to bring them to life rather than just letting them, as I said, recede into graphic and emblematic programs. So uh, anyway. Uh, this uh, piece is only about this big as well, and it's pencil on paper primarily. Uh, and this paper, you have to understand, is a very, very sheer paper. It's not a rice paper, but it's a paper made out of a fiber, very much like a rice paper. I buy it from a Japanese vendor in Los Angeles, from whom I also, I asked Kurt to send away to Japan for the 22 karat gold powder that I then use to make the gold paint that goes into making these images. Now, um, everything is, uh, the flower up above in that halating image is uh, basically white gold. All the gold you see is 22 karat uh, gold painted on. And then all these jewels are painted individually, cut out, and then collaged on here. Um, and this would be a really good example of what I was talking about before, of what I'm trying to do with this text in updating uh, common Buddhist, or what we would call familiar Buddhist imagery. Uh, jewels and and not only flowers, but jewels. It's not called the flower ornament sutra, <laughs> by the way, uh, in translation. And jewels are also an abundant imagery. Uh, okay. Here is a close-up of the inside. Uh, well, let's go back here. This is a in, later I'll show you a photo of the, the whole painting. The actual, this is just a close-up of the painting, of a section of the painting, of the primary image in it. The actual painting itself is about four by five feet. This is all painted with watercolor and gold and a little bit of acrylic paint. Uh, so what when it comes to detail, you know, as I was, if, if you were looking at this in the actual size, these lines here, would, unless you were up really close to the painting and you had really good eyesight, they would be very difficult to see. And each one of these gold lines is outlined on either side with red paint. Uh, in a, oh, sorry, what I took your seat. No, <laughs> uh, so this is a drawing on paper, also with white gold. And those tiny little pips that you see there, those were one of the original images that I got involved in, in trying to represent these immensities of propagating plurality. So these little pips are, you know, little clover shapes. And I like them because uh, they seem kind of atomic-like to me. They're both um, emblematic and organic at the same time. And, um, you know, putting myriads of them together uh, is a way of communicating these immensities that I was talking about. And here you have the flower, and inside of it, of course, 
it is collapsing into itself or perhaps unfolding itself once again the whole the imagery of the sutra essentially is telling us that everything is a reflection of everything else and you know this is just hard clinical factual discourse right now which tends to trivialize when in fact is something really ephemeral and at the heart of, of everything. If you have a chance to quiet your nervous system down enough, you can have this, it's not an experience as much as it's an understanding of the fact that everything is reflecting everything. And we don't, we're not going to go into that, it's unnecessary right now, and it would be inappropriate. But anyway, that's what's going on in here, this kaleidoscopic thing that's happening, right? With the myriad repetition. Exactly, of itself, and over and over again, for all, forever. Uh, it makes me think of uh, some uh, caves I've been in, Buddhist caves, in which there are Hundred thousand Buddhas yeah. you know, be the same. Well, if you if you go to for those of you that have, may have been to Japan, well, and one of the Buddhist caves. Okay, are you talking about India? I'm in Myanmar. Okay. Well, uh, I just came back from India not long ago, and we made a point of going to uh, Ajanta to the caves there that are uh, two thousand years old, nearly. Uh, or, you know, and uh, yes, but um, a more appropriate place that, that I found to be a real confirmation of this for me. For those of you that have had a uh, chance to go to Kyoto, in Japan, and you've been to the Sanju San Gendo Temple, you enter this hallway where there are 1,000 images, life-size, uh, multi-armed with halos, these are all carved out of wood, uh, 1,000 of them in this hallway uh, doing the same thing, giving you this experience of this, this reflective, you know, infinitely reflecting, propagating plurality. So here is what that painting you, you just saw, the close-up, you know, we were, we were inside that flower. Uh, so, the, and the actual painting, of course, is smaller than it's being projected here. It's all done on right, the same kind of type of rice paper. Not really rice, but a fiber. Uh, it has, you know, it's a very, very delicate thing. And um, so this is this is the picture, okay? And so it's just it's sort of it's so. Would you say it's fair for me to say that uh, Martha is working from image to text, and you're working from text to image? Would that be would that would there be something about that that would be accurate? <laughs> Of course, <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's obvious, not beyond accurate, it's obvious. Um, however, where Martha and I, what we both agree on, um, and I'm feeling more and more that way these days, and it's precipitating a kind of uh, conflict that I, I'm going to have to come to terms with, uh, I think something that all artists from time to time might consider is that ultimately it's all just a fakery because the... A trumpery. <laughs> what was that phrase that you were using? You read uh, that you said Dale didn't like necessarily what you like and I like the... The loss of uh, what? What was it? Uh, you talked about it when you yes, were Yes, yes. Uh, the failure. Yes, failure. The failure. And I, I think it. 
from the outset, uh, and I'm thinking of Bruce Nelm's famous drawing entitled Bound to Fail. It's, you're bound to fail as an artist because you are, we're continually dealing with intangibles. And eventually you have to come to some kind of conclusion, right? You struggle and struggle and you finally cobble something together. And perhaps, I'm, you know, it's, it's not necessarily fair to say that. You work really hard. You work really hard to be sincere, to do this thing. But in the end, you realize that you are going to fail because this thing that is here in the world now is something else altogether. It's not, it's not representative of the initial inspiration. It's not representative of the motivation and intention. And it's just this other thing that exists in the world for which you then have to spend the rest of your life apologizing. <laughs> And, like a poem. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's it's an interesting uh, futility that artists are involved in. Uh, in the old days, artists knew from the get-go that the whole <coughs> notion of illusionism itself was a was a distasteful act. But there was nothing else that could be done because for the longest time that was, that was an essential convention for the function of art. Uh, once that illusionism was uh, liberated uh, with the invention of cubism uh, and surrealism, which both were important uh, uh, components in then allowing us to have a language of abstraction, then th that put a whole new burden on representational, you know, imagery. So essentially, you're saying that the visual artist is in the situation of the characters at the end of Waiting for Godot, which you just mentioned earlier. But that goes against what we say. I can't go on. I'll go on. Well, but you know, that's right. Beckett knew from the beginning. I mean, the. At this point, we could say it's one of the most famous plays ever written, <clears throat> one of the most important ones, one of the most important plays ever written, and the very first words that the first character says are nothing to be done. <laughs> Here, okay, everyone, uh, take, you've taken your seats, and now we're telling you that there's there's nothing is going to happen here. There's, and and the all, and it's the most sincere thing that I, we can tell you because all the conventions, the most well-intentioned and sincere attempts at trying to not fake you out, you know, have failed. And there's there's nothing to be done other than we're just going to have you the try. time. That's right. You try. That's right. Well, why don't we try to take a few questions from the audience um, and have Martha come on back up, please, at this point. That was a good seat, though. And I'll, again, I'll recognize people from the floor. I'm sure there's somebody who's in a very rich, complicated program this afternoon. Um, I see a question in the back, yes. Okay. Yeah, this is about the um, quotes that you put in the poetry. Yes. So how do you do that visually? Oh. Um, they're really, it's simple. It's, they're just italicized at the bottom. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, you know. Okay. And well, usually, not only at the bottom, also inside the poems. Sometimes. Yes, sometimes inside the poem. But and are they like, like unbroken, like sentences, or do you break them? Yeah, they're, like, they're like prose. You have to buy the book. It says prose. But you pay a lot of attention to formal details in setting up your verse on the page. You have some poems in which you rarely use almost no punctuation, and then others that are very meticulously punctuated. So you're 
obviously the thing came out. Oh. Uh, and I also tried out. to not use pronouns because you don't like them. No, because of, it's a narrative. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, that was another question. Yeah, I could buy the book and find out what you think, but I guess. Um, does the pattern, the way you lay the poem out on the page, reflect in any way the photograph? Mm, no. I don't think so. It'd be fun to try, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, you can try that. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Martha and Tommy, I want to talk a little bit about the Nancy's. And uh, Martha, you know my prejudice against photography. You know, it, it's like uh, the evening is laid out uh, against like a patient eat her eyes upon the table, right? Yeah. Um, uh, when you, uh, with, with a painting and with a uh, poem, the, uh, the reader and the viewer complete it. Uh, whereas uh, a photograph is completed, at least in my limited imagination. And uh, so it's a fixed kind of thing. And I think that uh, for that reason, in a certain sense, it seems like a, a photographers should be paying homage to uh, poets rather than the other way around. And, and uh, uh, there's, uh, there, there aren't very many poems that have been written about photographs, and I just wondered what it was in, that, in those photographs that stimulated you to write, because uh, almost any line of a poem is much more elusive to me than uh, any photograph. You know, I don't quite understand what you mean by completed, because I think that um, being completed as in a not like a film or... Yeah, it's just finished. It's not like a film. A film moves along. Uh, a photograph is there. It's static. It's, uh, you know, it's printed. It, it, doesn't, yeah, I it, doesn't, it doesn't refer outwards to something else. It refers inwards. It takes time away from, uh, from experience. The photograph only is inward? Yeah. Well, I don't understand because it's a photograph of something, um, a broom or a, you know, a sky or a... a I, I, I'm not arguing that it isn't. It is. It's, the problem is that it is, not that it is. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> oh my I just God, don't think, you know, it varies. I think each one is different depending on who's right. looking at it or what the context is or um, where it's, you know, where it's shown. Well, let's, or, let's get back to, I mean, I don't want to do not this, but let's get back to a patient eat her eyes on the table. I would never say that about one of Tom's paintings or any paintings. I don't have that sense that it's fixed. You may not, but some of the other might. I don't think so, actually. I, I really disagree with that. I don't think anybody would. But you can certainly say that about a photograph, about most photographs, that they're fixed and they are not elusive that they refer to themselves. But they you don't stand well, what out. About, what about world. series? What do you do about a series? Um, I mean, really, I'm dealing in with Robert Adams with a book that's a series. There probably was a show in a series. And, um, I, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I, I disagree, you know, even though the question was directed yeah. at you. Yeah. I, I have to say that I, I, I'm just wondering whether you're just playing devil's advocate or something like that. I mean, that's a possibility. Oh, yeah, but... <laughs> and maybe it's because I know you so well. Be, because. It, to me, that's an impossibility, especially given what, what the that the that the photo that the that the photograph is somehow a completed entity. That especially, specifically, because of everything that I was yammering on about earlier, that every single viewer is going to. It reflects something else. That photograph is continually morphing like, like everything else. It, it, it would be a misunderstanding to imagine that it's something static and stagnating. There, that's an impossibility for anything and everything. So let me just, can I say one other thing that I think technologically sure. is true, which is um, cropping. So if you think about it, I remember um, uh, my, um, my photographic husband used to say, you know, look at Degas. 
and the way in which he frames things and think about how that can be utilized in photographs. And if you look at photographs that I think are really interesting, they have a kind of framing that cuts things off. And it makes you have to think about what's, where is that ballerina's leg anyway? Yeah. And, and where is, you know, what's on the, what, where does it extend to? Or do you know what I mean? So I think cropping is one of those things that suggests a much larger world than is actually just in the photograph. And Degas, as we know, was an amateur photographer. Yes, yeah, a big he, he, he invented a lot of photography. Invention, yeah, yeah. Invention. And we also know nobody remembers Degas' photography. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I think they also know his paintings, and the paintings were informed. The cropping of the paintings and the drawings were totally informed by his looking through. Well, through take, that. The, uh, take the Coppertone uh, um, ad um, where the dog is uh, pulling the child's uh, bathing suit down. Um, there's also an extension into the field of that, of that action. So to say that a frame by itself, to say that a frame by itself of, of, of is elusive in the sense that it, it, implies a, uh, it implies a larger world around it is to simply say that that's a frame. Well, I mean, I think also Martha cites in her book, uh, Siegfried Krakauer, the famous mid-century German uh, theorist of cinema, and he says, you know, one of the powers of photography is, yes, it fixes the instant, but it always also includes a future that can't be defined, because we, we glimpse in seeing the moment as the past, because it's been fixed in the photograph, we also understand that there will be a future for the image to which we will not belong. You could also not say, I'm going to stop, because uh, I know I should stop. But, uh, yes, I, I was going to make it stop. You could also say that, the, that the, 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 the power of photography is that we have power over it. That, um, you know, that, that, that uh, it doesn't challenge our ability to be voyeurs. Well, you know, there's no interchange. It doesn't talk bad to us in the way that every other art form does. Well, but I think, it, again, I'm not sure I do, because I'm talking too much, but the, 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 it's a technology, but it's more than a technology. And the question is, when does photography begin to see for us? And that's how much of it is the subject, how much of it is in the object itself. That's, and that's, that's, the question. that's the question for me. Um, I see a question here, I'm sure. Yeah, I think one way that um, both your works may be addressed in terms of photography is by thinking back to um, a blow up uh, by Antonioni. Yeah. And the way in which uh, when Thomas uh, starts looking at his own photographs that he has developed himself, he discovers that by looking intensely and very attentively, like you do, Martha, you right, uh, at his own photograph. He discovers that the photograph itself has an incredibly uh, complicated depth that is as complex in many ways as some of your uh, Buddhist paintings. Mm. All right. Um, I would recommend that film if you, about photography if you haven't seen it. Um, any questions? Don't be shy. Yes? Uh, this question is for Martha also. I'm wondering if it is possible to transform your poems out of other photography into your own photography. Oh my. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know. Because myself, I, I love photography so much. I find recently that I cannot take any photos anymore because I always find there are other people who are taking better photos than myself. <laughs> and I think maybe the best way to, to solve this problem is to read more in order to be more creative in taking photos. That's why I'm asking no, this question. I, 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 even though the question is to you, <laughs> my, my recommendation is to stop comparing yourself to others, and then you solve that problem right away. <laughs>
But it's okay. difficult in an era, Tom, in which photography is so ubiquitous. It's absolutely everywhere. Our, our days are saturated. Yes, but, la but language is everywhere. Absolutely. And commonality is everywhere. So language is uh, never before we shut him up, yeah. you know, before we all fell on top of him. Uh, uh, he mentioned that ad, you know, the photo of the Coppertone, the, the, the Coppertone ad. So the Coppertone ad, uh, although that was an illustration, uh, it was based on photography, or but it, it's a vulgar thing, it's advertisement, it's not w what we would call, it's art because it has, it has to be created, but it's not one of the things that gives you the greatest insight about the nature of life and death, which is one of the things that art tends to get involved in from time to time. And so, um, every, I just, need to emphasize to you that um, it's impossible for you not to be able to make an individual statement. It is impossible because you have created your own identity. You don't look like your friend next to you on one side and next to you on the other. Your voice isn't the same. You have already created yourself up to this point right now. And that, that gives you, your, you already have your identity. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if you go around comparing yourself to everybody else, you know, the clothes you wear, the makeup you wear, and all that, well then you're going to be in big trouble very quickly. So don't, do not do it, do not do it. <laughs> Just ignore everything and everyone. That's the other irony as artists. You, we have to, you just have to, you know, I feel that to some extent I've been really lucky that I've been an incredibly naive person throughout my whole life. And that naivete, I think, is, is absolutely essential because it's given me a chance to be isolated from all that other stuff that I could be comparing myself to. You, see. you know, the other thing I would say is, I thought what you just said was a really interesting thing, is to read things, go to the museum, uh, take walks in the park, I don't know, do other things that um, allow that, that person that is you <coughs> to see um, and spend days walking around with your photograph, free with your camera, and see what happens. But good luck with all of the, the thing that we did not touch on, and I keep but, but it, I know. <laughs> Go ahead. Look, I'm just trying to do her favor. Just <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I'll say. <laughs> Creativity is irrational. So. Be careful when you think what you're doing is very prosaic and look at it and see how you can subvert whatever is really rational about it. You're probably going about it in that way and do something that is irrational and then you'll be happy. Well, I think on that point we'll, we'll bring our uh, afternoon to a close. Please join me in thanking our two wonderful I invite you to, to join us upstairs in the galleries. We have a small reception where um, we can duke it out over all these principles um, <laughs> in the comfort of uh, food and drink. So um, I'm going to whisk you away first, and then others, um, if you go up to the main galleries, um, you'll also see some photography and some paintings, so you can think about that too. Thank you again.